All right, so first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to speak to you. Um, I'm really, I, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, so thank you for giving me the floor. Um, we're going to talk today about, I'm going to do a quick brief introduction into what is user research you, or user experience research. Um, I've been told there's a variety of backgrounds here today, so I just wanted to breeze through that quite quickly in case um, anyone isn't familiar. Um, and then talk specifically about what is unique uh, about UX research in the museum and public sector space. And then dive into specifically what user research looks like at a museum. And, and go into some case studies. Um, I've got three different case studies, depending on the amount of time we have. Um, and then finally, um, just to finish off, to talk a bit about why UX research matters in the public sector. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time. As I mentioned, I can't see the chat, um, but if you put them in the chat, uh, the moderator will read them out for me. Um, I'll also, there'll be some time to uh, dive into the case studies as well. I'll make sure to stop and uh, ask for questions um, at the end of each section. So who am I? Um, uh, as he said, my name is Casey Scott Songen. I am a social and cultural anthropologist. I have a dual degree in ethnomusicology, but that's less relevant to this. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience working as a user experience researcher. Um, I originally started in uh, digital agencies, so helping with website design, uh, digital product design, and then thinking about um, physical and digital products um, and designing things like that for companies like Target, which is a department store in North America, uh, BMW, Nike, uh, Starbucks. Um, and then when I moved to the UK about eight years ago, um, I started working at the British Museum uh, as their first uh, user researcher. Um, so at the time they were building a digital team in the British Museum, um, recognizing the need for a more robust digital product um, beyond the walls of the museum itself. Um, so I was the first user researcher brought on um, to develop the practice there. And then I moved on to the National Gallery where I was the senior manager of data and insight. And I had was very lucky enough to have a team uh, of a uh, data scientist and a user researcher, a qualitative uh, research specialist and myself. And we did a lot of really amazing projects um, at the National Gallery, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. Um, I have been involved in the last five years or so, a lot in conversations around um, data ethics and artificial intelligence and how that relates to museums as well, um, which has been quite an interesting, there's a lot of interesting conversations and I could go on and on about that as well, but <laughs> not the topic for here. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I left the National Gallery about a year ago. Um, to found a company called The Creative Researcher, uh, which promotes um, smaller organizations or individuals um, to help teach them how to do user research in a way that's manageable for them, um, but also um, ethical and proper. Um, so, but with often, unfortunately, smaller budgets. So figuring out how to be a little bit creative about how you execute research. So what is user research? Um, user research can go under a bunch of different names. It's not, it's in some ways it's new, in a lot of ways it's not new. Um, the way that we talk about user experience research, UX research, um, has only been around for the last 10 to 15 years or so, um, but it's existed in design research or participatory design or applied ethnography. Um, these are all different approaches to a very similar thing. Um, at the end of the day, the role is to be the voice of the people and help bridge the gap between what your user or your audience is doing and what your business or product needs are. So this happens over a large span over an entire project life cycle. 
Um, research helps us understand what their needs are in order to identify new user-centered opportunities. Um, at the end of the day, we want to build products that are useful, engaging, and easy to use by people who not only come to the museum, but also engage online. Um, so identifying user-centered opportunities allows us to focus on building products that we know visitors are going to engage with and benefit from. Um, so how do we do this? We accomplish this by speaking to visitors, getting feedback, having to help having them help us tweak or create new or existing products um, through a variety of qualitative and sometimes quantitative methodologies. Um, here you can see, I like to think about it as three main sections. So there's exploratory research um, when you're trying to define what a product could be. And then there's iterative research when you're trying to develop um, a mo minimum viable product or MVP. And then evaluative research is when you have when you've launched a product and you want to understand how well it's performing. When you think about me different methodologies that you can use, um, I look at it on two different scales. So there's anything from attitudinal research to behavioral. So attitudinal is more around uh, what people say. And then thinking about behavioral is more what they do. We also have the range of qualitative and quantitative. So anything from um, interviews, which would be very attitudinal and very qualitative, um, to observations, uh, behavioral observation or participatory observation, which is more behavioral, qualitative, um, into the quantitative side of things, which is obviously analytics, um, but also can be bigger surveys or uh, A-B tests or multivariate tests um, and things like that. So I like to show this slide when I'm talking about research because I think when people first say, oh, we need research, they'll often come to me and say, um, I need a survey. And you're like, OK, well, what's your question, right? And but they're like, no, I need a survey or I need you to do interviews. And you're like, OK, well, or I need focus groups. And you're like, this is great. These are all methodologies. Congratulations on knowing what it is. But without understanding what questions you're trying to answer and what outputs you're looking for, as well as how much time you have and how much budget you have, there's no way to say that that could be the right thing. You know, if you come to me and you say, I want a survey so that I can understand um, the deeper motivations behind why someone chooses to go to this particular place. And you're like, OK, well, you're not going to get that from a survey. A survey is more um, a quick understanding of basic behaviors or basic thoughts or feelings. So it's a very extreme example, but it's something that I really like to um, point out when we're thinking about different methodologies and how we choose methodologies. Um, at the end of the day, there's a ton of different types of methodologies we could use, um, but you know, it, it really depends on what it is we're trying to answer. Any questions about that so far? All right. So what is unique about user research specifically in the museum and public sector space? One of the first things um, that I noticed when I started working at the British Museum is that user research in the past was typically associated with digital products. Um, and it was often, you could have that physical crossover um, into you know, experiential things, or especially now we're talking VR and AR or the gaming industry. Um, but in general, it was tied to some form of digital product that associated that either existed in the digital world or in the physical space. But when you think about museums, it started to really expand across um, a bunch of different departments two main reasons. Uh, one is that user research was a relatively new practice um, to come into museums. It's not necessarily relative, it's not a new practice in general, but for museums, especially museums in the UK um, and the US, it wasn't something that they had really done in the past. So 
when they started to bring researchers in, such as myself, um, they there wasn't necessarily a clear understanding of what it was that researchers could provide. So the answer was everything. <laughs> Um, but that is also the mentality of working in a museum. Um, museums often have limited funds for staff and they often require staff to be flexible and work across different departments, um, especially the smaller the organization is that you tend to find the more flexible the roles are. Um, so it's interesting because when we start, when I started working in the museum space, user research, of course, sat in the digital department. It worked with the digital products. Um, and not just the website, but also audio guide, digital um, exhibitions and uh, digital artworks. But also we started to get into physical exhibitions, events, uh, content, thinking about paintings, um, and then even into sort of the more revenue generating side of things, um, how we can help optimize cafes or shops or licensing agreements. Um, and even just sort of the experience of being on site. Another thing that makes research in the museum sector and the public sector really interesting is access to public data. So in the corporate environments, um, you often have to pay for a lot of data if that you're looking for, um, but there's actually a lot of data that's available and a lot of data that's available about public spaces. Um, so, for example, census data um, in the UK specifically, we have free data sources such as the International Passenger Survey, and that's a randomly sampled uh, survey that's given out to anyone who visits uh, in terms of tourism. Um, the, there's the Great British Tourism Survey. Uh, there's even things like Transport for London, which is the public transport network in London, um, publishes their usage numbers and their footfall numbers. And when you're talking about, um, for example, the National Gallery, the National Gallery sits in Trafalgar Square. It has a tube station called Charing Cross that's right there. So there's not, you know, people could be using Charing Cross for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is the National Gallery. You can start to look at how people move throughout the network um, and how and to understand how tourism works within London itself. Um, even things like Airbnb have published uh, public data around traveling and the types of stays that people have and where um, like different areas are attract different kinds of visitors and things like that. So there's a lot of data that you can really start to dig into that's available freely and starts to paint a picture um, as well as provide context for who is coming to a museum, why they're coming to the museum. Um, and then we started using that data to create predictive modeling um, using machine learning techniques to start to think about what are the what are the things that then influence people to come in the future? So that's just um, an example of some quantitative data that we were able to use um, in a way that you don't necessarily have in the private sector. One of the great things um, as well is that public spaces mean that people come to you every day. Um, a lot of times when you're doing research, you're have to create provide an incentive you get people to come to an office you you know if you're doing a usability test you've got it all set up and that's great um but it's when i started working at the british museum i actually had to change the way that i was doing research because uh a we didn't have a lot of uh resources we didn't have a lot of funding in order to spend money on research but also six million people come to the British Museum every like every single year. So you're talking between 15,000 and 30,000 people are coming in the doors every single day. And what that means is you've got all of these, you've got your audience in your office every single day. So what I ended up doing was rather than doing longer, more involved interviews, I could I realized I could I could do smaller intercept interviews on but more of them so over time you could 
you could cover the same kind of material that you wanted to cover in an interview, for example, but breaking it up into smaller intercept interviews and then speaking to 40 or 50 people rather than 10 meant that you could still get everything you needed out of that and you didn't have to do any sort of pre-planning. Um, it meant that the design team could be quite uh, flexible. So often I'd come in the morning and the design team would be like, we've had this idea, we've made this wireframe, can you test it today? And then I'd go down in the afternoon, do some tests and then give them the feedback by the end of the day and they could then move on to iterating on the next day. And that is something that's like, um, it felt quite magical because coming from a corporate environment where you have to recruit people in advance, you know, you usually need a couple weeks notice. Um, you can set it up to have like regular recruitment, but it still takes a lot of time and planning. So this sort of changes the game and changes the way you can think about where research interceptions can happen in the design space. And finally, there's an interesting psychological shift when you're speaking to people um, on site in a museum or a gallery. There's so in London, um, the majority of the large institutions are free to visit. Um, so British Museum, National Gallery, all of those places. Um, you don't need a ticket. You can just come in. Uh, it's free to visit. You only have to pay for special exhibitions and there's usually three or four a year. Because of that, people have when you reach when you want to speak to them or you want to gather feedback there's this sense of wanting to give back to their community because they feel like they've been given something for free and therefore they are more likely to want to do research or to want to help you with your research um, because they feel like they're giving back so that obviously in order to unpick that a little bit you have to be really conscientious of that um, when you're asking people to do things that there is that power dynamic that's coming into play that wouldn't necessarily be there before. And at the same time, um, you get people feeling this sense of ownership in a way, like they can actually make a significant change. Um, that they can that they can contribute to a place that they almost feel like they have a stake in. So that's something that does change the way that they provide feedback, but as long as you have that in mind, um, it can be a quite a strong motivator. And I've actually, you actually get a lot more feedback than you would otherwise, um, because people feel like they are contributing to something. And finally, um, this is a really important thing to think about, and that I think often gets overlooked, is that a lot of the a lot of how under people understand uh, success, especially in the museum environment, is often driven by engagement rather than revenue. So, you know, it's free to go to a museum. You can they get revenue both from grants, from special exhibitions, um, from the cafe and from the shop. But in general, if it's free to see the gallery, if it's free to see the objects, um, the, their success metric is how engaged their audience is and how many people are coming and not necessarily how much uh, they're spending. So this is a quote from the strategic plan uh, from the last five years at the National Gallery uh, and, Doc and Dr. Finaldi, the director of the gallery said, it is a public museum with a uniquely important collection of pictures for the benefit of all. We who currently have responsibility for the gallery want to share this resource and our enthusiasm for it with the widest possible audience. So that's a really interesting thing to have be as a driving goal or motivation for an institution is, you know, of course, obviously they need revenue to survive, but the amount of revenue that they need is not necessarily something that they worry about. It's a secondary thing. Um, in a lot of cases, breaking even is the goal rather than making money. Um, and therefore, they have like a low threshold to to get to. Um, and even necessarily attendance isn't necessarily a KPI or hasn't been in the past. Um, they get regular attendance up to six million people. 
Um, in fact, there's a lot of conversations that are having that are had about what if more people come? Like how many is too many? And how do you regulate audiences and things? Um, so, so then the success metric becomes engagement. And engagement as a main success metric has a really important um, factor into research itself. So if your main success for a product is that someone has learned something new or experienced a collection or has learned about art, and this could be either on site or online, it's going to change the way that you are doing research for this product, that you're iterating on this project, that you're even designing this product. Because if your goal is to design a product that you can sell, then that's great. Your testing makes sense. It's very like, does this, does this journey lead to someone buying a product? It's in a way a relatively linear process. But when you're trying to understand if someone has learned something from doing something that they have a lot of agency over, it starts to get a bit complicated. And this is where we start to look at combining qualitative and quantitative methodologies to answer these questions. And that's sort of where the work that I did in these methodologies really started to develop was when we needed to, to report on KPIs that were that were a lot more difficult to understand and to grasp. And then not, that's also to say that a lot of these institutions also have external KPIs, they have governing bodies, then that also impacts research requirements. Um, there's often, at least in the UK, very specific um, questions that need to be asked and surveys that need to be done in order to meet funding requirements um, and funders have their own uh, research requirements. So all of that sort of gets taken into into account. So what makes engagement metrics even more complicated in a museum? Uh, well, the first thing is art is subjective. Um, so being interest being interested in his different types of history is subjective. If someone chooses not to go to a Monet exhibition, you can't say necessarily that that person doesn't like art or they're unhappy with the exhibition. It could be that they're just not interested in Monet as an artist. And that isn't a reflection on the gallery or the gallery's performance or an engagement metric. So it gets quite complicated because it's trying to unpick why would someone not go see a thing because they aren't interested in the art itself or the artist or is because they aren't happy with how the product is being delivered, how the exhibition was shaping up, what the narrative of the story is, or the marketing. All of that you start to unpick and it gets, it requires often multiple methodologies to tell that story. People often visit for all different reasons and it often looks the same. So for example, you can have, um, you can have a say two people are visiting the National Gallery. It could be a first date. That was quite common. You take someone to to the gallery on a first date to impress them or whatever. Um, and it's two people walking around a gallery. It could be people, two best friends who are catching up after a long time and they're using the public space just to catch up. It could be two art aficionados who um, really love art and are here to see their favorite painting that they see every day. Uh, it could be two people who are cutting through the museum because it's quicker to get to lunch, which I've in stopped and interviewed people like that before. So that looks, but that observationally could look the same. The behavior is relatively similar in those experience, in those different examples. The, from the outset, you, you see just two people do you know doing particular behaviors, but the motivations are very very different. So you start to you have to start to unpick not just what people are doing, but why they're doing what they're doing. So why does this all matter? This matters because the metrics that drive design heavily influence how you conduct research. You often need to adapt research techniques to the main KPIs that your product or your institution or your project or whatever it is are trying to deliver. 
And that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. When so, you know, if someone were to come to you and say, I need an interview, it's not the right question because ultimately what happens is the things like what's the what does success look like for a project or a product is going to affect what is the question that you're asking and what is the output you, that you're looking for. Time and budget is time and budget. Those are linear scales, but it really is thinking about what is that research question that gets you to understand what kind of data you need, what methodology or methodologies you need and how they work together. So this is where the power of user research comes in. It's where you can flip the idea of understanding what data is telling us to using data to answer questions and solve problems. So just, yeah, just to reiterate, it's thinking about under, like you can have a lot of data in front of you. You can co be collecting data for a variety of reasons, um, but if you spend all of your time just trying to figure out what that data is telling you, if you don't have the right data, if you're not looking in the right way, it's you're never going to get a true story. The only way to to not get overwhelmed is to start thinking about how can we collect data quantitatively or qualitatively that's specifically answering questions and solving problems. So I used to always, um, I like to say to people, so what, right? If I give you this number, what are you going to do with it? So what? You know, if this, if this thing changes by 20%, so what? And if the answer is nothing, then it's not a relevant piece of research to do. It's not a, it's not a relevant data, it's not relevant data to collect. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to shift that norm from ticking that box to getting people to think about what questions do I have and how do I solve those questions? How do I find the answers to those questions in order to solve the problems that I'm having? Any questions so far? All right. So. Now that I've covered a lot of the theoretical aspects of <laughs> what it is we're doing and why, uh, what does research actually look like in a museum or gallery? So as I said before, for a museum or gallery, it's really dangerous to think of qualitative and quantitative research methods as separate. They can often provide two different aspects to a larger picture, yet these skills are often found in different departments. Um, and that's not necessarily museum specific, that's um, I think across the board, you'll often get data analysts, data scientists working in one place, and then you've got market researchers, uh, user researchers, they're all in different departments working separately. Um, but we can't rely solely on understanding what our audiences are doing, as they're often driven to similar behaviors by hugely varying motivations. Um, so this becomes relevant when we want to understand how we can continue to engage with visitors and how we can encourage repeat visits, for example. Um, so, for example, a visitor may come alone to look at some of their favorite paintings one day and bring a friend to share their favorite paintings in the next day. Um, so how can we support these different motivational visits? So um, one of the best examples I love to give is a case study, not mine, um, but an anthropologist was doing this study on eating habits. And they were interviewing people in their homes and they said, um, you know, show us your fridge, Tell, walk me through what your, you know, what you cook for dinner, what you cook for lunch, what you cook for breakfast, etc. And then they'd show them their fridge and say, here's all of our vegetables and, you know, here's all of, all of our lettuce and cucumbers and whatever else. And then um, the anthropologist said, show me your rubbish or your garbage bin. And they look in the garbage bin and the garbage bin is filled 
with takeaway containers and rotted vegetables. And so even though that person, it's not that they were intentionally lying about what they were doing, they were just trying, they were talking about sort of their best case scenario. Like in an ideal world, this is what they want to eat like, to the point where they even go out and buy the things that they want to eat. But at the end of the day, if they don't cook and eat those things and then they just buy takeout or takeaway instead, then their actual eating habits look completely different. And this is why we want to look at not only what audiences are doing, but why they're doing what they're doing. So there are a lot of different ways that can it, we can do this. Um, here are some examples. Um, quantitatively, we can look at open data, public data, which is what I talked about before. Um, in the museum or gallery space, there's often ticketing and sales data. This has been a really interesting conversation, and I'll talk a bit more about this um, in a bit, but especially around COVID, because COVID has changed the way that ticketing and sales works in museums and galleries pretty much across the board. Um, and so there's a lot, a lot to unpick here in a way that for the last 50, 60 years, there was the expectation that you could just walk into the gallery or the British Museum for free. There was no tickets. Uh, you stood in a queue sometimes uh, to regulate numbers, but in general, you just got to walk right in. So all the ticketing and sales data that we had was specifically around special exhibitions or sales data in the shop and the cafe. And then you were able to extrapolate how many people shopped at the shop, for example, versus how many people walked in the door via people counters, um, electronic or manual. Um, now, or since COVID, a lot of museums have moved to a free ticket model where you still have to buy, you still have to get a ticket even though it's free. And that was to control, originally to control numbers um, in order to get, um, adhere to social distancing. So that process created a lot of data that they didn't have otherwise. Um, and I think in the majority of places, they've chosen to keep that practice. Um, also, visitor attendance numbers. Um, anyone from like a security guard clicking a thing at the door uh, to uh, people counters that have, you know, infrared that you walk through. Um, also, things like web analytics, um, understanding digital, because Remember, museums have a digital space, they have a physical space. You're looking at everything holistically. Um, also, we had systematically sampled exit surveys, and a lot of those were demographic, um, understanding who was coming. And then we used Wi-Fi data to create spatial mapping of how people moved through the building um, as their uh, phones would ping off of different Wi-Fi routers. And then on the qualitative side of things, we're looking at uh, post visit surveys, uh, visitor tracking and observations, qualitative intercept interviews. Um, so that's what I was mentioning earlier about just popping downstairs, having a couple of questions, seeing who you run into, um, but also using that in a way to systematically sample um, at different groups of people or seeing, you know, if there's a higher concentration of families at a certain time and things like that. Also, of course, focus groups, uh, usability testing, interviews, uh, TripAdvisor. I love spending time on TripAdvisor because a lot of people like to post comments on TripAdvisor. And while it's not the most robust or objective uh, data source, it is interesting uh, to look at what people have um, either felt that they experienced or felt the need to share, or they'll often talk about what their favorite objects are or favorite paintings are. Um, and that's can over time, you can get quite a bit of data from that. Um, understanding user journeys and stories, and then anything from um, observations around spatial mapping to larger ethnographic studies. Uh, we did one that lasted a couple of years uh, with children's programs and understanding um, learning and development as the children participated in various programs throughout the year. And that was a very interesting project. 
So this is a lot of different types of data. Um, it's a lot to sort of wrap your head around. It can feel quite overwhelming. And indeed, there's sort of two issues about having this much data to hand. One is having too much data. It becomes an art to start to think about what is relevant versus what is a distraction. And then we have to think about how do we store that data in a way that allows easy access. So thinking about in the same way that you would want people to be able to access objects, you have an information, uh, you have context and content around a particular object. Um, how do we access that in an easily accessible way? And how do we keep other types of data, visitor data? How do we think about visitor data in a similar way to library data or collections data? And then um, a really important topic is then how do you maintain data integrity and context within the pieces of data you have? So this becomes really important when you start to think about machine learning and AI. If you're feeding data into a machine learning process or you're feeding it into AI training, how do you keep the integrity of that data and the context around where it was collected, how it was collected, and the subjectivities that come with all of that? How do you keep that attached to the piece of data so that it isn't stripped away and it becomes just an objective piece of data um, and then you end up with a racist AI? <laughs> um, yeah, and that creates data bias. The other thing that becomes problematic is when you have so many different types of data or methodologies at your disposal, how do you collect the right data? So for example, as I mentioned earlier, um, at least in the past, you could visit the gallery, you could do a variety of things without ever creating a piece of data about your visit. So if you weren't intercepted and you didn't and you didn't buy anything, um, this is before ticketing, obviously, you could theoretically walk on site, spend six hours doing everything, interacting with everything. Um, but as long as you didn't need a ticket, then you leave. We don't know what's happened and what that looks like. So there's a lot of questions around if something is free and you can walk right in. How do you know who is coming and why? So in order to deal with those kinds of issues, we have to change the way that we think and to move to a more inquiry based model of data analysis. And this is something I alluded to in already, but trying to get people to move away from tracking a metric that ticks a box to creating data informed decision making within the organization. So it's about making the data we collect useful. It's moving away from tracking just for tracking sake and fulfilling requirements of various funders or KPIs or whatever um, have been set up. And it's understanding who are the audiences that are coming. Um, but this is where we start to come up against the fear of newing, using new ways to process and analyze data because it breaks from tradition. There's that that issue of we've done it this way for 250 years. Why should we change? Um, there's an I remember having an interesting conversation with someone who wanted me to do a piece of research at the gallery and they wanted it for a funder. They were trying to get some funding in order to create more accessible toilets uh, for disabled people. And they wanted me to do research around who would use a disabled toilet in a museum or like the who would need an accessible toilet. And I was like, this is this is a classic example of tracking a metric to tick a box because you're as you're being told that you need to provide research data on why you need an accessible toilet. But let's take a step back and trust me, like I am all for doing research. I love research. Obviously, I'm here, but Sometimes you just need to build an accessible toilet. It doesn't matter if only one person ever uses it. There's an ethical question at stake here that a, that a research project isn't going to help you answer. That is a perfect example of just they wanted to tick a box. They wanted to say we did the research, 
we, the research says that we should put in an accessible toilet and therefore we will do it. When in reality, sometimes <laughs> the data is already there in that, you know, you just need to build an accessible toilet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's sort of getting people to to switch their mentality from I need I need this just because I need it because someone might ask for it to what are the questions I'm trying to answer and what are the problems I'm trying to solve and how am I going to use that information to make a change? So how do we use qualitative and quantitative methods together in order to accomplish that? The first, there are two different ways. The first is to use a qualitative research method to dig into a discrepancy or an anomaly uh, discovered in a quantitative analysis. So this can be used to see if an anomaly is the result of maybe improperly formatted data to gaps in our knowledge about our visitors. For example, uh, at one point there was a drop in visitor numbers and we wanted to know why. So we used external data sets and internal figures to understand why this was happening and who was missing. This became an issue in the press <laughs> and there was demand from ministers to know why numbers were dropping in galleries and this is pre-COVID. Um, was it Brexit? You know, was it terrorism? One thing uh, was a shared drop in visitor numbers with the National Portrait Gallery uh, versus everyone everywhere else. And if you're unfamiliar with London Museums, the National Portrait Gallery uh, shares the same building as the National Gallery. Um, and because we share a block in London, the obvious data pointed to location being the main issue. Um, so then the question became, what was it about the location? So we did a deep dive. We did some surveys, um, some interviews, um, some intercept testing, and we found that the location in itself wasn't a deterrent for the majority because they'll come anyways. Um, and the location the of Trafalgar Square, which is where the National Gallery is, didn't have an impact. So we were able to rule out a specific location as the reason for the drop. Um, it was more of a byproduct of larger things happening and other galleries uh, doing more exciting exhibitions and doing more marketing um, that there was just a natural shift in uh, our visitors going elsewhere instead. But it became something that was like the initial quantitative data just pointed out that there was a, you know, the numbers had dropped, you know, the press got involved. It was like a whole thing, um, but we were able to use qualitative methods to understand why that had happened. Another way uh, we use quantitative and qualitative research methods together is to narrow the focus um, on a problem with tested hypotheses in order to decrease potential for researcher bias, such as cognitive or confirmation bias. Uh, we use qualitative research methods to avoid putting undue importance on things or miss critical elements because of a lack of awareness. Um, so, for example, we noticed an exhibition wasn't selling as many tickets as we had originally anticipated that it would. The hypotheses as to why included the impact of it being staged in, in a location that had never been used before on site, um, or the lack of awareness regarding this particular artist. Well, we did know that these were factors, as they had been picked up in a rolling survey that we had been conducting, we wanted to understand the importance of these factors and if they told the whole story. Um, so we went out and conducted intercept interviews in the gallery. In these interviews, visitors told us that even if they had heard about the exhibition, they were unclear what to expect um, or misunderstood the proposition of the exhibition based on the title. So unfortunately, changing a title halfway through the exhibition is relatively reasonable, un unreasonable, sorry, to ask. Um, but it gives us a starting point for additional content around the exhibition. So without looking at that qualitative investigation, uh, we would have only looked at the factors that had originally we had originally anticipated and subscribed importance to them in relation to one another. Um, but this way, we were also able to continue to iterate um, on what we were asking, not just what we were providing in the product itself, 
but we were able to iterate on the research itself and the quantitative data we were collecting. Any questions so far before we dive into a couple of case studies? I hope this all makes sense. You're a very quiet audience. <laughs> so please do ask me anything um, that I've gone through too quickly or didn't make any sense for whatever reason. There are no questions in, in chat. Great, okay. So some case studies. The first is um, a case study from the British Museum. So the British Museum wanted to redo their marketing in a really big way. They wanted to develop a brand message. Um, they had created a tagline, but they wanted to understand sort of the deeper level of, of what they could start to, how they could talk about the British Museum to potentially new audiences. So we did this really, uh, in a way it was quick and dirty. Uh, we, it was very simple. We started with the question, what does the British Museum mean to you? So the first thing we did was we had um, a goal of look of 1% of daily visitors. So in the, it was a low period. Um, there was only about 2000 people coming into the gallery at this point. Um, so we ended up getting 170 responses, which was pretty close. Um, sorry. No, yeah, sorry. No, there was about 10,000 and as a low point and then yeah, we got about 170 responses. So we set up a table in the entrance way um, and got visitors to fill out a little piece of paper as they came into the museum that just said what does the British Museum mean to you we tried to make it a bit more like an activity people came over um, some people drew pictures I have this cute image of like a little kid drawing a picture of a snake that is one of his favorite objects in the collection um, so we spent all day doing that we took our 170 responses and then we ran a workshop uh, with staff to find themes from the testing. So of those 170 responses, we whittled it down to five different statements of what we felt people meant um, by the question, what does the British Museum mean to you? And then we created a survey and we sent it out across four platforms. So the newsletter, Facebook, Twitter, and then we also surveyed people on site to get that digital and physical uh, representation. We got 1600 responses and we asked them to to um, look at the five statements and agree or disagree. So either you can see in the green, it's like strongly agree to strongly disagree. And you can see that there's one statement that really that starts to wins in con considerably compared to other statements. So this is a really uh, this is an example of using qualitative data to create a focus for a quantitative data analysis. So the interview question was broad. What does the Muse British Museum mean to you? No follow ups. It was quite broad. Um, and then we did the workshop in order to narrow it down. And then we focused on that particular those particular five things to get an understanding of which one felt the most in alignment um, using a quantitative survey. Sorry, can I have a, have question? a question? Yes. Do you use some uh, art in for methodology to analyze the pictures or it was just just a picture? Oh, good question. Do you mean from the when I mentioned in the survey uh, with yes, people yes. drawing? People drawing uh, the picture on, on the paper. So if you analyze the, the these pictures or uh, or just use the text description or something like this. We did analyze the pictures. Um, sometimes it wasn't as relevant, um, but we, for example, um, 
a lot of times people would draw an object from the collection that they really liked, especially children. So we translated that to there were particular objects in the collection that what is what that the uh, the British Museum meant the love of an object rather than a specific object. So we sort of like took it that one step higher, if that makes sense. I'm trying to remember if there were other ones as well. I think it was mostly, yeah, object based things. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Any other questions? All right. The next case study, um, this is one of my favorite projects, and this was also at the British Museum. Uh, we developed a new audio guide for the British Museum. And the audio guide was more than just an audio guide. I think when we think about audio guides, we think about the handheld little things with speakers that you have to stick in a number. Um, you know, some of them get slightly more sophisticated. But the British Museum had the opportunity to completely redevelop what an audio guide meant and what it could be used for. So you can see here on the bottom picture, it's actually a smartphone inside of a case. Um, and we developed a whole like interface and website um, that allowed people to navigate through the collection. They could look at specific objects in the collection. Um, but they also we had also embedded Google Maps uh, so you could you could map out routes throughout the British Museum um, based on the kinds of objects that you wanted to see. So um, in case you're unfamiliar with the British Museum, there are 8 million objects in the collection. I think there are 97 galleries. It is a really big place and it is not the easiest layout. Um, it's sort of you've got, I guess if you're looking at it from above, you've got uh, galleries along here, 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 and then the middle also has a building in it, and um, you've got three floors. And so when you're walking around, you sort of have to go all the way around the building. It can get really confusing really quickly. So the audio guide was meant to help people navigate just the sheer number of objects the sheer number of galleries um, in order to create and to learn something that they wanted to learn. So after the initial um, MVP was created, so the get the audio guide was already in its in its form that you see there. We did some usability testing, so this was interesting de developing this methodology because um, a lot of times when we're doing usability testing, we're talking to maybe eight to 15 people, depending on the different options. Um, but in this case, we had such a wide variety of people who might use this audio guide in so many different ways. We also had to take into account that the audio guide was available in, I believe, 14 languages at the time. <laughs> so not only this, so not only is there a lot of different ways you can use the audio guide, there's a lot of different people coming from all over the world who might be using the audio guide in different ways. So we looked at the most commonly used, like purchased audio guides. At this point, the audio guide had been available for, I think, three months. So we used that data to decide what languages we were going to do our research in and English, Italian and uh, Mandarin or Chinese um, was the were the three most common languages that were purchased. So we did three different things. We did unmoderated surveys. So we built these tablets and put them on stands in the queue. So as people were waiting to purchase the audio guide, there was often a queue of maybe 10 to 20 people. You often had to wait five to 10 minutes. So while they were in the queue, um, they could fill out this survey. We had 104 uh, pre-survey or pre-purchase responses. And then you can also fill out when you return your audio guide, there was another tablet there. You could fill, fill out a survey there. So we had 87 responses to that. And that 
survey was available in English, Italian, Russian, and Chinese. We then did moderated interviews, and this was a, definitely a group effort. Um, if you can't tell, it was more than just me working on this. Um, but we had 127 moderated interviews conducted. So we did 55 in-person pre-purchase interviews. So those, again, were three to five minutes. They were very quick. Um, and while the visitors were waiting in the queue to purchase. So they were similar to the surveys, but they were a little more in-depth. Uh, we used the initial survey responses to dig into what kind of questions we should have conversations about. Um, so we had 55 of those. Um, partially because they were waiting in the queue and uh, there was nothing there was nothing else for them to do. Uh, we did 17 in person interviews and so this was usability tests where we actually followed the visitors on their journey throughout the entire museum uh, using the audio guide. So we didn't stay with them for like the full time. Most of the time it was between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, and before their behavior started to repeat. But that first 30 to 40 minutes and then we would, if we could, we would meet up with them at the end and see what the end process was for them. Um, we these were all um, like random people and they had no incentives provided or anything. So uh, we felt that after about 40 minutes of taking their time, they would you know, rather be doing their own thing. Um, and then we did 55 in-person interviews with visitors as they returned the audio guide um, and that was focused more around their experience with the audio guide, what they liked, didn't like, etc. Uh, we also did some observations, so we randomized observation times over a period of weeks um, and we did audio desk observations, so counting numbers of visitors, um, how like movement, how they how long they were in the queue, how many were in the queue at a time, the types of guides that they chose. So at the time there was this audio guide, um, but they had also put out something called the family guide, which had interactive family uh, games on it. So they could, uh, participants could, choo could opt to choose that as well. Um, and we also did, <laughs> usability follow alongs. So we observed uh, visitors, but with no interference at some point in their visit using the audio guide. So this is sort of the um, the stalking bit a little bit where you sort of follow someone along at a distance to see how they're interacting with the guide, with the objects and with the gallery. Um, usually they didn't last 30 to 40 minutes, but um, yeah, we would sort of the researchers would walk around the building um, find people with audio guides and either intercept them, ask them some questions or just observe what they were doing. So all in all, it led to speaking to 318 participants in four languages. It's probably the biggest usability study I have ever done. So what did we find? Um, and obviously I, I won't go through everything, but just a couple of really interesting insights. Um, on the left here, you can see that's one of the main screens. So when you first start the audio guide, it says, what would you like to do today? You can view highlights, you can take a tour, or you can explore the collection. Um, the testing found that people wanted to take a tour of the highlights, but that functionality wasn't there. So you could either view the highlights, which gave you a list of things, uh, a list of objects to see, um, but it didn't necessarily turn it into a tour. Um, the other thing is that they couldn't find the first stop of the tour. So when the when the route and the map had originally been designed, the assumption was, well, we don't know where they'll be starting, so they'll have to find the first object and then once they're at the first object, we will know exactly where they are and we can give them directions from there to the next object. However, <laughs> a lot of people couldn't find the first object, understandably, sometimes it was quite far away. And so people were getting really frustrated and they were really struggling um, to, to use it at all. So what they decided to do uh, when they fixed, when they did the next iteration, was they created um, 
they they assumed that you would start from the audio guide desk as most people did and if not it was a good indicator of where it was everyone knew where the audio desk was because they had gotten an audio guide so they could go back and start there and then find the first object from there um, and then the other, the final thing was that as they were going through the tour, there was all this other functionality and all this other information about other objects nearby or, you know, exploring other things to do at the museum or even like, like tours that were taking place. But people were too afraid to lose their place in the tour to explore more of the functionality of the actual audio guide. Um, so here you can see on the right hand side is a new version of the audio guide based on this feedback. Um, you can see at the top, it, now it says explore the museum and take a tour. At the bottom has little icons that show highlights, so you can go into particular ones. And they also added a tour called the highlights tour uh, once they go into, once you go into the tour button. Then there were some other th interesting things that came out of the wider research and the observations. Um, so in general, people weren't really aware that the that there was this kind of audio guide that can enhance their experience um, until they were on site. And so it was really important from a marketing perspective um, that they were able to communicate what was expected in the audio guide because people when they think of an audio guide, as I said, they think of a very specific thing. But in reality, it's quite different and it's quite comprehensive, but people that wasn't what they expected when they went to buy it. So it required a lot of extra marketing and extra explanation leading up to them getting it to know what to expect. Um, so you can see here on the right, that's actually the audio guide desk there um, with the big red stripe. And then you've got the three panels along the top. Um, those are those were the new marketing banners that were put in in different languages that explained a little bit more about what the audio guide was and did. And then in the bottom corner, you can see there's two different researchers there um, doing intercept interviews at the returns desk. And on the left is an example of uh, the map. Um, this was very interesting because obviously a big feature of the audio guide was being able to being able to navigate the large museum. But what we actually found were that people would often pick up the audio guide and then also get a free paper map and they were using them together, partially because they didn't they were worried about losing their place in the audio guide. So they would use the paper map to find the things, you know, and or look at other things while not using the audio guide. So what we decided to do in the future actually was to not spend a lot of time um implementing additional uh map enhancements but instead had left the paper maps on the audio guide desk with the assumption that people people just really like paper maps they like to feel that it makes them feel more comfortable to have a paper map um so rather than fight against that behavior we used it to our advantage where they didn't have to have a paper map to use the audio guide, but it was there and they actually worked together and they reflected the same thing. Whereas before the map on the audio guide was only from Google Maps and it looked different. You can see here on the left, we've actually uploaded a copy of the actual uh, paper map version into the app. So, you, so now they look the same. So you can easily go from one to the other without having to, without getting lost or having to figure out what equals what. The other thing that was interesting, um, the last thing that was interesting here was it was often, people often use the guide in groups. So um, it was the original hypothesis was that people use an audio guide alone. You know, you're, you're sort of cutting yourself off by putting in headphones. Um, but in actuality, you'd often get a group of people and they'd want to use the audio guide together. So they would um, they'd want to take a tour and they'd be like, OK, everyone at the same time, one, two, three, push the button so that they were all on the same page. 
Um, so we actually worked on building and functionality that allowed you to share between and and be on the same page um, <laughs> automatically without having to like time yourselves and you know someone's lost and oh no someone clicked away and now we can't find their spot again and um, there was trying to get rid of a lot of the in anxieties and insecurities around people using it in a group. Any questions about that case study or any comments? I have a question uh, about uh, group behavior. Did, did, did you try to find out something about group behavior? Uh, you, you described the group. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There was a lot of that. Um, there, the, there were two sort of main differentiating factors for group behavior and it was definitely children. So if if it was a family coming with children, um, that was a very different experience than uh, groups of people coming together, um, either like friends or a couple, or that they often had very similar behaviors, whereas when it was parents with children, it was completely different. And that was very interesting because we had the family guide and it would be like little games you know, you could, you know, it's like, go stand like the mummy, and then there'd be like a picture of the mummy, and then you have to go and go like this, and, or, you know, like little, little things, and the, the audio guide was aimed at, you know, sort of children in the, like, five to nine kind of range, um, but then we saw, we found a lot of people would buy the family guide and give it to their child, and then they would buy the audio guide for themselves, when, which is, you know, makes sense, but in reality, these two things were developed separately by two different teams. And so they didn't actually correlate with one another. And so it started to get quite complicated. And we saw a lot of parents really struggle with the audio guide, uh, with the family guide, sorry, because the children would want to run off and do their own thing. And the parents couldn't see what the child was trying to do because it was on a smartphone. And so they were trying to keep up with the child and they ended up struggling to use the audio guide themselves. We also saw there was definitely cultural differences as well. Um, so the family guide, for example, um, a lot of Asian parents especially um, were more interested in having their children have an educational experience because for them going to a museum was more about education. Um, and they felt that the family guide didn't provide enough uh, education and information, and it was too interactive and playful. Um, so we often had families, um, Asian families would then bring it back and give their children the audio guide. Versus, um, you know, it, we had other, you know, uh, people who were repeat visitors, especially, um, or London, natives would often come or locals london locals sorry uh would come and use the family guide um over and over and over again because they knew that there were games on there that they could sort of let their children just do their thing um and it was almost like a you know a fun activity rather than a learning activity um but it was often because they had been there in the past so yeah so there was a lot of interesting things around thinking about how do you create an experience that is informative, um, especially for people who feel like museums should be um, a place of information, which they are, you know, or how do you how do you balance that with the need for um, for play and fun um, from a lot of people who are trying to just entertain children having like a day out in London? Sorry, I rambled a little bit about group behavior into the family guide. Any other questions? Thank you. It was interesting. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one more case study for you, and this is from the National Gallery, and I alluded to this a bit earlier. This one's quite text heavy, so I apologize in advance. Um, but there was sort of a lot to communicate for this one. 
Um, as we all know, uh, COVID changed a lot. Um, the National Gallery had been open consistently for 200 years, um, even through World War II, uh, as they liked to talk about. Um, not in the same capacity, but um, the in a certain way, um, the National Gallery had never closed. And with COVID, everyone had to close their doors. And so um, the gallery was closed for, I can't remember the exact number of days now, but it was quite a few days. It was like a, maybe like a hundred something days. Um, and the National Gallery was the very first gallery in London to reopen. And so a lot of other galleries and museums in London looked to the National Gallery as to how successful the reopening was going to be. Um, there was pressure from the ministers and the government for the gallery to open um, and become like the case study for how um, public spaces could open in a safe way uh, back when we were just coming out of the first lockdown. So that's a really tall order um, on two fronts. Uh, one is that we we had to completely change the way that people experienced a gallery in a way that was unprecedented. You know, in a lot of people who've been to a gallery before know how to to do a gallery, right? How to visit a gallery, but we were changing that behavior, so we needed to communicate to them. Um, and communicate to them in a way that they saw or heard or understood. Because a lot of times people are used to blocking out signs, not really seeing um, and, and just expecting to do things the way that they could do before. Which is fair because when something has been the same for 200 years, you don't think it's going to change. And then the other issue, of course, is that we had all of these regulations in place um, from the government around social distancing and numbers and we didn't have the functionality um, or the ability to at the time to to regulate the number of people who were coming to the gallery so we had to build an entire ticketing system that hadn't existed before um, which is what i alluded to earlier um, where people had to get a free ticket in order to help regulate time slots so there was a variety of things um, that changed. So yeah, timed ticket entry, two meter social distancing, staff now had to wear PPE. Um, we also had a paid exhibition on at the time. And so that became extra complicated because we had, uh, we had to regulate how people moved through the space, but and, and in a timed way, but also for the paid exhibition, but also paid exhibition people could go to the free free galleries, but then we couldn't stop them from leaving the exhibition to see the galleries. So there was a lot around that. Um, we obviously had things looked a lot, of, a lot different. And then the big thing that came in was there was a one-way system with possible routes and no opportunity to go backwards. So, um, in a way that people were used to just roaming for free anywhere in the gallery. We implemented a one way system where they could choose to see different types of art um, on three different routes. Uh, but once you chose a route, you could theoretically do all three routes, but you had to it, you had to change routes at a very specific place um, and you couldn't ever go backwards. And that was to help with uh, social distancing and everything. We also had to update all of the websites and digital contents and everything to help communicate all of these things that were going to change. Um, so this obviously meant a very different experience to what visitors had come to expect over the last few decades. Um, so we had to put in a thorough research investigation and KPI reporting structure in place to allow staff to to A, to quickly react to feedback because we weren't sure it was going to work. So we needed we needed to be able to make changes really quickly. So we couldn't just let data sit for three weeks, four weeks, and then look at it all and write a nice report and present it. We needed to be really quick and iterative with it and be able to make changes almost daily. But also 
we needed to be able to share this information with the wider London and galleries and museums and public spaces because that we were a case study for the government on using public space. So once it was announced that we would be reopening um, my research team, we, con we quickly conducted stakeholder interviews across the organization in order to understand what key questions would need to be answered once the gallery was open. So we focused on five different categories. Um, the first was the on-site experience. So do visitors feel welcome and safe? Um, were our measures accessible enough? Were they had, you know, how were they, what kind of tools were they using? What were their behaviors? Um, we wanted to know who was returning. So previously we had a large audience of older people come to the gallery. Um, and then with um, COVID restrictions, um, it was, you know, more dangerous for older people. So were we gonna even get people to come back was the question. Uh, we wanted to look at the digital experience. So obviously they had to book tickets in a way that they hadn't before. So not only did we have to build that functionality into um, the website, we had to expect that people would show up on site and then have to book a ticket online. And that experience needed to be as simple and easy as possible. Um, we also needed to optimize these new ticketing journeys because we had never um, we had never required free tickets in the past, so understanding how that was going. And then finally, uh, we did have a membership program, so we needed to understand if our members were still feeling like they were getting value for money with this new experience. Um, so in order to provide answers for all of these questions, it's obviously quite far reaching. Uh, we suggested a joint qualitative and quantitative approach. Um, and this has been invaluable. This was invaluable for opening because it allowed us to get a deeper understanding of the visitor needs and expectations while not putting too much focus on the outspoken few because there was a there was a major concern and in and a reality that some people were just quite outspoken about COVID in general. Um, and we wanted to make sure that the research we were collecting wasn't just listening to people who had a larger issue with the things put in place rather than specific to the gallery needs. So obviously this is a lot of questions to answer. So we collected data <laughs> in a lot of different ways. Um, the other big thing to remember is that due to these new restrictions, however, there had to be limitations on the methodologies available in order to collect feedback so these were taken into account when determining the various methodologies available. Um, so for example, we couldn't do in-person interviews anymore because if you had someone on site, you could you would you were then taking the place of the very few numbers that were allowed to come in. So um, just for context, I can't remember off the top of my head the the actual numbers, but if we were getting 15,000 a day before, the maximum allowed with social distancing was more like a thousand a day. So we didn't have the capacity to um, to potentially fill all the spaces that would be requested, you know, the number of people who might come back. Also with um, having people on site, obviously we wanted to decrease the amount of physical and in-person things. So all of these methodologies um, took that into account. Um, so we, we we worked with our survey partner to collect survey data on visitor behavior, motivations, expectations, satisfaction, and feelings of safety, well-being, and reassurance. And then um, we also worked closely with an analytics partner to develop new dashboards, which allowed daily and weekly data access to a variety of measures. Um, it was treated like a six week research project where all the team capacity was devoted to learning lessons on a daily basis. Um, so and then after that six weeks, the project was heavily scaled back. 
So you can see here we sent out post visit emails to every person who got a ticket, uh, which was interesting because for the first time we had access to everyone who came because as I said before, you used to be able to walk in. Um, and so it required random intercept interviews, but then in order to get a ticket, you had to give them your email address. Um, so we built it into the system that they could opt in to receiving um, surveys. So we sent emails to uh, post visit surveys to anyone who had opted into that. Uh, we also we used Google Analytics to look at uh, ticketing data and purchase data and understand how that worked. Um, Tessitura is was our ticketing system, so we looked at ticketing data, membership data, donations and customer data there. Uh, we also put a survey on the website, uh, which was like a pop up box um, on the gallery entry planning page to understand a bit more about what their needs were at that point. We did do on site observations, especially in the first few weeks of opening, so um, we were able to you know, do observations from afar room observations rather than interacting specifically with visitors. Um, and we also tracked dwell time really, really closely because um, and we used actually paper methods of like writing down the time and then having people hand it in when they leave um, or go as they go through different checkpoints um, because we had never thought about dwell time before. Um, because it's a museum that just people come in, they spend time, they leave. There had never really been an issue of understanding dwell times um, so we used we used manual tracking um, and then we also used people counters, which were automatically which were automatic people counter data data to track the capacity within the building and the total visitor figure. So we could see how many we created a real time dashboard where you could see how many people were in the building at any given time uh, based on the ins and the outs. Um, we also used a company called Smartify, which has um, audio guide data, and then we collected feedback via email or phone or on site, um, and that was basically whenever anyone provided feedback to any member of staff, we created a system that would collect all of that. So yeah, so we did this for six weeks, um, which allowed us to have that flexibility um, to make decisions really quickly and have the data to support those decisions really quickly. Um, and in as real time as possible because we had to make those decisions in real time often. Um, yeah, and it was a really successful program. Uh, we were able to share our insights and our learnings with the other museums and galleries, um, and they were then able to subsequently open uh, using either the similar or modified versions um, of our opening strategies. And that's the last case study. Any questions? Can I ask? Uh, yeah. I, I'm interested in uh, what did you describe? It is uh, heavily connected with physical physical environment. Did you research some virtual exhibitions? Yes. Yeah. That's and that's a very interesting thing because obviously in. UX research, I started in digital and I always sat in digital teams, but a lot of it became the physical space. Um, but we did this really interesting project and I think there's some published papers on it um, that I can follow up and send the link to um, with this company called Story Futures. And we developed some AR technologies um, that work in the gallery itself. Um, and there's this amazing painting that was commissioned by a church. Uh, it's a Nicholas Ma's painting uh, commissioned by a church in like the early 1600s, I believe. Um, and the uh, we used sort of VR headsets, but taking the environment into play where you could stand in front of the painting and actually they had gone and 3D mapped the church um, that the painting was originally there for it still exists and then they hired they found a songbook of the monks that lived in that church originally from the year that the painting was painted so they went to that church and they recorded monks they recorded a choir singing the songs from the book from the year 
of the painting in the church that it, the painting was in. And they use that as the sound in the experience. So you could stand in front of the painting and see the real painting. But when you looked around, uh, you were in the church um, that it was originally from. And we did a really big uh, research project on that because it was one of the first times that we had used um, AR or VR in that kind of way in the gallery space. Um, so yeah, I will send a link to um, the published paper for that, that that talks about the methodology and the findings. Um, because yeah, <laughs> um, that will, it will be in more detail, uh, in more detail there. Thank you, it, it, it will be very good to have, have such paper and to use some methodology from this. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, I only have a couple more slides. Um, so just to finish off, why does UX research matter in the public sector? So public spaces and services at the end of the day are for the public. So it's important to think about how we can put users or audiences at the heart of what we do. Um, you know, in, in a different way that, you know, if a company is selling a product, Obviously, they want to sell the product, so they want to understand why users might buy that product or what they need from that product. But in the public sector and in the museum and gallery space, it's very different and you can almost forget why you're doing what you're doing. It's easy to, you know, for a curator to tell that story of that painting from an academic perspective. But at the end of the day, it's important to also remember that public spaces are for public use. And what does that mean when we're designing experiences? It's also easy to overlook research in general and user research when it's not revenue generating. So it, it does cost money. Um, you know, it requires software, you know, survey softwares or um, hiring interviewers or do or time of doing of hiring a researcher or doing in, interviews or incentives for focus groups. It's not a lot of funds, but it does take money and often people will deprioritize research when it comes to uh, a product the developing a product. But in reality, you can waste a lot of time and money designing a product or a service that isn't going to work or help the users are meant to help. So it's almost it's better to spend a little bit of money at the beginning to make sure you're going in the right direction than to spend a million pounds developing a VR about a church that's never been tested and then putting it out on the floor and nobody's interested and nobody wants it. You know that but by doing iterative uh, research and understanding how someone might want to use something and what's the value they're getting, you can start to to tell those stories and make those decisions, that means that at your end product is going to be much more valuable and much more important to the people who, uh, who will use it. And finally, um, there's a lot of precedence in how people, how people make decisions in especially institutions, especially old institutions, um, as many museums and galleries are. So there's a lot of opportunity to create organizational change through evidence based decision making. You know, there's when you the fact of the matter is, is that the world has changed a lot in the last 30 years with the invention, you know, with the introduction of digital things look a lot different, they act a lot different, and the expectations of people are a lot different than they were 30 years ago and into the past. So when someone argues, well, we've done it this way for 200 years, maybe, you know, maybe that's a valid argument. But the fact of the matter is, in most cases, things will have changed so dramatically since the since that decision was last made, that it's important to think about how do we collect evidence uh, or how do we collect data in a way that allows us to have evidence based decision making? And it's not easy for everyone. You know, it's when I think about, you know, 
deciding which artists get a special exhibition that takes years of planning and you know loans conversations years in the making and you know and curators and everything and its audiences are often sort of last on the list and it's fair to say that a lot of these things are academic and you're per creating new knowledge in some way um, but also if you create new knowledge and nobody reads it then what's the point so i think it's just it's just trying to balance those two things of you know what always has been and how you can make um more evidence-based decisions in a productive way that keep your audiences at the heart of what you do